go through and you and you uh, so we'll all we can all fill out a paper and, and give it in uh, and really it's just like this it goes and before we begin let me let me remind you of the criteria that we knew what it was but you can just get a piece of paper and write on it brevity so we're supposed to be in the range of three to five minutes okay because otherwise we could be here all night <laughs> and we need to give simple you know clear explanation so clarity was one of those so I have on here brevity the length of the presentation and sufficient response given in the time allotted okay that's what that's what I mean by brevity length of presentation and sufficient response in a given time. And if you hit the range of three to five minutes, then, you know, you get the top score, okay, on that one. All right, clarity, clarity of ideas and clarity of language. Okay, so there's theological language. If it isn't clear, if you use theological language and it's not clear what you mean, then you're, the group you're talking to won't understand. So if you're talking to children, teenagers, adults, people who have never heard of Jesus or the Catholic Church. I mean, you have to be aware of the language that you're using, right? So the clarity of ideas and the clarity of language. Um, orthodoxy, appropriate vocabulary, and ideas consistent with the faith are two things under that. Appropriate vocabulary and ideas consistent with the faith and pastoral um, effectiveness, that it motivates toward faith. It helps to stir up faith in someone. That's primary what, primarily what I would mean by pastoral effectiveness. And that, of course, considers the people you're talking to, too. You know, the, uh, knowing the audience you're talking to, knowing how to talk to this group of people to stir up, help to stir up faith or open the door toward faith. And a naturalness, and I consider that comfort and ease with the topic and faith integrated into worldview. Let me explain that a little bit. So in other words, what you're talking about of faith isn't just simply this separated thing that has nothing to do with anything else. You help somebody see how it fits into their life and into the big picture. Okay. Now, gee, Father, how do I do all that in three to five minutes? Well, you do your best, you know. And basically, I, on each of those things, I, I have a scale of one to five. This just helps me to kind of think about the different parts of what someone says. And the reason I had have you all do it too, and next time I'll actually come, it'll be a lot easier. They only have the name of presenter, and then you can put your name on it too. Um, actually, I don't think we had you put your names on it, just just the presenter. And that gave, us an, gave me an idea of what everybody was hearing and uh, kind of balanced out. So it's not just my perspective, but everybody's perspective. And I think sometimes when we when we when we have to come up here and do it, um, you know, we're, we're being put in the place of the listener and the one who's giving it. So it helps us to listen a little better, I guess. To, you know, just, I'm sure you did. You do that with homiletics. You probably do that with homiletics too. Right? Yeah. So anyway. With notes, sir. What's that? With notes. Yeah, with notes. Sure, sure, sure. Right. Well, we're upping the ante here because <laughs> somebody comes along and says, what is that baptism thing you Catholics do? I mean, you know, you, you can't have notes in your pocket. You've got to tell them. So, especially as a minister of the church, you know, if, if you're just a regular, ordinary Catholic, like I'd say, well, I don't know. I'm going to have to ask my priest, you know, but I don't know. I'm just a deacon. And, well, you just can't say that. <laughs> so, okay. Did you want to copy? A copy of your your notes. notes? Um, not necessarily, because I really want to hear so it. It won't help with the grade at all. <laughs> <laughs> I think it helped you to be organized and to prepare, but I'm yeah. I'm kind of going to listen to it. You know what I mean? So, Father, yes. My sheet said without notes. Was that without notes? Mine did. I don't know. Her, maybe others didn't say that. Mine said yeah, without, without notes. Without notes. notes. Yeah. Just, okay. Right. 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 Just That's what I thought. Okay. Get up here and do your stick and you know. 
God communicates who he is through us, right? He communicates who he is through you. And so part of this is the Holy Spirit. So I would suggest praying a little prayer to the Holy Spirit as you come up here. See how you do, you know? Okay, so... Give me so we're going to pray. So we're going to pray. In all things, let's gather in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. I have baptism. Okay, and to remind us of what group you're talking to and what was the original topic? Mine was Grandma wanted to get her child baptized, I believe. Her grandchild baptized, right. right. And you have to discuss with her what? The meaning of baptism and the consequence or the, the benefit of the baptism. Okay. And, it, and the need of. Right. So grandma came to you. So you have to talk to her. Is grandma coming? So. I think that the, parent, the parents had come, but, but through discussion, it was discovered that I thought that Grandma was wanting the child to be rushed through the okay. process. Yeah. Okay. Really? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Did you have um, B as the was the topic? B? Like mine was A. No, I had one. No, we all could pick one. No, 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 I'm no, sorry. No, this, no, this, is, this is a different one. That's right. The, <laughs> that's the written assignment. Right. So we, it, the first one was without notes, you know, where to explain what a sacrament is to someone who knows something like about Catholicism. But that's me. Christian. That's okay. me. That's it. The second one was without notes, explain the benefits of receiving the sacrament of baptism. Be sure to mention the specific grace that the person receives. Or that's me. Okay. So sorry. it's not grandma. That's sorry. Written assignment. <laughs> sorry. Well, good. I'm glad we got that clarified. It's up to three minutes already. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Being first, we'll be able to do this. With the, the great thing about baptism is when, when God created humanity, he intended all of us men and women to live forever, to be immortal for all time. Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, which brought about original sin, which we all know the penalty for sin is death. God, or God Jesus, had a remedy for that, which is baptism, cleansing with water. It gives us sanctifying grace, which aligns us back with God. It makes us, um, has an indelible mark upon us to where we are, again, righteous with God and joined with his church. Uh, the matter for baptism is water. The pouring or, the, or full submersion in the words are, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and then the Son and the Holy Spirit. Either full submersion or pouring of the water over the head three times. Um, there was something else too. Never since Adam and Eve had sent Adam, I'd read somewhere that Adam lived to be like 930 years. And through, through time and history, man's longevity has continued to decline to where it is now. But with baptism, we have the hope and faith of eternal salvation with God for all of eternity once we die. Once our physical bodies die to this world, you can think of, you know, we always hear we go to heaven. Heaven is not necessarily a destination. It's not up there beyond Pluto somewhere. It's a, it's a way of, of being alive in a whole new way. So when we die, as Father said a couple weeks ago, we do not become angels. We are still people. We are alive in a new way and we participate in that life until Christ comes back to regain all of humanity to where we are joined body and soul that is our, our end hope in eschatology we're taught that we we will lead immortal lives at that time in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit
was too late, but it was also instituted by Christ. <laughs> Make disciples of all nations. <clears throat> Read it here before I go up without notes, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Without notes, in your own words, explain what a sacrament is to someone who knows nothing about Catholicism, but is a Christian of another ecclesial community who understands there are material and spiritual realities. And the assumption was that I was talking to a, an adult in a congenial type conversation. And I, and I do have an outline if anybody wants to. This is what I'm going to try to think and remember. But. <clears throat> I remember you're having a conversation with something. I'm having a conversation with something. Okay. Ooh, there's a lot of notes up here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to start like in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's always going to work. Thank you. Amen. As Christians, I guess, I guess we can start with the, with the fact that we believe in Jesus Christ. As, as, as a Christian community, we believe that Jesus was born, he was died, he was tortured and died, and then he rose again on the third day. Okay, So we can start with that fact. And the reason Jesus took on human flesh was because of his great love for us. And in the Catholic Church, we believe we have certain concrete signs that reinstitutes that love that Jesus has for us. And in the Catholic Church, we call those signs the sacraments. And those signs, those sacraments, are um, God's love manifested in an earthly manner to us as we live here on earth today, even though Christ is not physically here with us. Those, the definition then of a, what we would call a sacrament is an out, outward sign instituted by Christ to give us grace. An outward sign being the, 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 the prayers, the, the elements of the earth that tells us, man, something big is happening here. It's something big. Instituted by Christ, is, he did something on the, on the earth while here and instituted and gave it to us to continue on. And to, by grace, it gives us, on um, giving us outward signs and grace, it gives us the, um, the grace for salvation. Now, in the Catholic Church, we believe that Christ gave us seven concrete, concrete signs of his love. And isn't it, isn't it interesting that seven, the number seven in biblical, is kind of the number of perfection. So here we have the seven signs. Those seven signs are used and, and, and uh, celebrated along our earthly life. The first one being baptism. When we're first in the Catholic Church, we have what well, we celebrate infant baptism. And that reconciles us, the washing of the original sin reconciles us to God. And then as we grow and become a little bit more mature in our faith, we have the opportunity then to, to confirm it, or not, excuse me, we have the opportunity then to, to uh, examine our faith a little bit deeper, and we have confirmation, uh, which is the sealing of the Holy Spirit upon us to help us throughout our life. The third is the Eucharist, that's the body and blood of our Christ, of Christ given to us. That gives us daily strength when we partake of it. 
as we mature and we grow on, there's times when we're going to screw up. And we have what we call the sacrament of reconciliation. Now, for most Protestant denominations, it's confession. You know, and we have the eerie signs in the movies where you have the dark confessional. But reconciliation, we call the second room the reconciliation, where we reconcile ourselves back to God. We're given forgiveness. We ask for forgiveness, and we're given forgiveness. Again, in our lives, we can go along, and we might become ill. So we have the sacrament, what we call the anointing of the sick. In the movies, it's called Last Rites. Or if you really go back farther, it's extreme unction. And that is not necessarily a, a sacrament of, of guaranteed healing, but it's a, it's, a, it's a sacrament where we are given the graces of maybe mental healing, spiritual, or the love of Christ to come back into his salvation. Then there's two sacraments in as far as uh, our living our lives out. We have the sacrament of holy orders, and that's for those who select to want to be with Christ. And then we have the sacrament of matrimony, which many people will celebrate, and that imitates Christ's unity and fidelity to us. We imitate that. There's two things required of a sacrament, matter and form, to be valid. Matter being those things, those earthly elements. Form being the, the specific prayers that are, that are offered. For instance, in baptism, we have the matter being the water, the pouring, form being the, um, the form being the prayers. I baptize thee in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And all the sacraments have this, have a specific matter and form to do that. To, also, to be valid, they must be the, the person to, to uh, well, actually, it was a matter and form that they're to be valid. So anyways, again, these are the things that Christ instituted uh, for us. And there's nothing magic about them, but it is a very concrete part of our lives as Catholics as we go along in our lives that reconcile us continually back to God and to salvation. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I am Jason Hello. <laughs> I have confirmation details about the sacrament. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The sacrament of confirmation is one of the sacraments of initiation. There are three, baptism, confirmation, and the Eucharist. Today we've heard about baptism. Maybe we'll hear about confirmation. In a later presentation, the Eucharist. The reason it's known as the sacrament of initiation is because it does just that. It initiates a person into the church, into their life with Christ, um, into God's family, into many things. Like any club or any organization, one might begin, they need to be initiated into that group. 
and sacraments of initiation do just that. Now, it has been said a few times already, and in this presentation, the order is baptism, confirmation, and Eucharist. And the reason for that is because in the eyes of the church, confirmation has always followed baptism, to the point that in historical days, it was immediately after baptism. The apostles were the first ones, after they baptized, they would immediately anoint somebody with chrism, and they would confirm them at that time. And the idea that from that was that baptism was completed by confirmation. Now, when we think of completeness, the opposite of that is incomplete. And that's not what baptism is. It's not saying that baptism somehow was lacking. <clears throat> what confirmation does is it perfects the grace that we receive in baptism. And so without confirmation, we are not able to live the fullness of our life in Christ. We're still able to do amazing things. We're still able to be a wonderful creation, but we are missing something that is provided to us by confirmation. And that is why it is so important. It was only recently that it began to be changed where we celebrate baptism at birth or thereabouts, a Eucharist in grade two, and confirmation in grade eight or high school. But traditionally it has been the other way, where at birth you were baptized, given confirmation, and in some rites of the church, even given the blood of Christ on the lips at that moment to receive the Eucharist as well. The idea there is that the grace is conferred instantly and stays with the person then for their entire life. Um, there are some places in the world that still do that today. It's known as the Restored Order, and they celebrate um, baptism at birth still, but then at first Eucharist in grade two, they celebrate confirmation right after the homily, and then the children receive the first Eucharist. And then religious education continues on for the rest of their years as a young adult and as an adult, but the grace of the sacrament is given to them immediately. Now confirmation places an indelible mark on the soul of the confirmand, and by being indelible it means it cannot disappear after death. And there are only three sacraments that do this, as we just had a quiz on. <laughs> so baptism, confirmation, and holy orders. And again, this is a mark that persists. And this mark, um, it does many things for a person. As we heard a few semesters ago from Brett, we talked about John Scotus. And one of the things that he said was that confirmation makes a person a member of the army of Christ. It makes them a soldier of Christ. So confirmation is like a rank within the hierarchy. Baptism is when you first get entered into the group, and then when you're confirmed, you're made a soldier of Christ. And that came to us from John Scotus, and again, it's a great analogy for what happens at confirmation. Confirmation also calls us to be a part of the mission work of Christ, and it calls us to four important ideas. We also heard about these just last week. Those ideas are... Um, slipping my mind right now. <laughs> so, let's see here. The first one is, uh, yep, they're, they're, they're great, they're four ideas. So, um, <laughs> and when they come to me, I will say them to you. The last one is the obligation. And the obligation that we have, it obliges us to be um, the full person that we can be in the life of Christ. It obliges us to live the, the, with the Holy Spirit in our life. Um, and uh, it config configures obliges and two others that start with a D and uh, <laughs> <laughs> disposes and uh, there we go yes so it gives us the, these four attributes are given to us in confirmation and um, the intention there is to to align us to give us a, an ability to be able to go out in the world complete the mission of Christ by being by being using these four things that were given um, last, I will say, of course, that confirmation was instituted by Christ himself. It is an unmerited gift for us. Christ promised it after he spoke to the, the apostles after his resurrection, and it actually was given to us on Pentecost Day when the Holy Spirit descended upon them. And those, it's the same thing that happens today. When confirmation is celebrated by the bishop, who is the ordinary minister, the Holy Spirit descends descends on the confirmandi and the bishop says the words be sealed with the Holy Spirit and at that moment the person is confirmed and they begin their new life in Christ. Thank you. There wasn't one.
Oh, where were they at? It was simply an explanation. Distinguishes, that's the other one. Thank you, gentlemen, for uh, being the guinea pigs for this uh, section. I think you did pretty well considering being first. Uh, I would just say, in spite of you always having the same audience that you're talking to here, try to probably try to put yourself, if you have a, a different audience, in the mindset of that audience when you do it, okay? I mean, Maybe some of the others will be talking to you know teenagers or something. That doesn't mean you have to be hip, but it just means that you know you got to get really down to earth when you explain something and things like that. Just no, but I think it was a it was a great first first run. Okay, so start. I we're still working on baptism, but by now we should be getting a pretty good idea of the sacrament of baptism considering our reading, um, some of us just talked about it, so on and so forth. We were on page 9 of the baptism notes. You might get your handy dandy chart out if you have it, because it's, you know, have that out every class, because it's good to look at. It's got a summary of just about everything, not everything, but the main things that we want to remember about the sacraments. And technically speaking, we should be up to Eucharist, but like I said before, it's going a little slower because, because we need to get the fundamentals down and we're still working on getting those fundamentals. We're just about there. Okay, maybe I could start this section with the prayer, though. okay? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, 
we thank you for the graces of the, of the sacraments, especially as these last two weeks we've been reflecting on the readings, especially the Gospel of Mass, on the grace that you give us through baptism and Holy Eucharist. We ask you to continue to enliven those graces in our hearts as we prepare for yet another sacrament, to be ministers of the sacrament of baptism. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, the grace of the sacrament of baptism. By baptism, all sins are forgiven, original, personal, as well as punishment for sin. And we talked a little bit about that last time. How, how great that is to be an adult and to know that, that the debt that one owes for the damage that one sins does, even that is wiped away. And, you know, some people might say, well, I'm, I'm going to wait till my deathbed like Constantine did, right? <laughs> he waited till his deathbed until being baptized. And, of course, sometimes in the early years, you know, people used to do that. But that's taken an awful big chance. Um, and also not realizing, it's not only taking a big chance, but it's, it's not realizing that, you know, we're meant to live the resurrected life beginning here and now, you know. Uh, so in other words, we don't want to take the, the, the magical view that somehow, you know, unless a baby's baptized, there's no way for them to be saved because somehow if they're baptized, then, you know, it, it's like a, you know, a magic formula or something. No, and I think, unfortunately, that's the mindset of some people, not usually young people, but usually grandmothers. No offense to grandmothers. But um, but it's not, again, it's not magic. On the other hand, um, you know, we shouldn't, on the other hand, it's not magic. So we just shouldn't think, okay, if I, if I just, I'm gonna hold off on baptism, I'm gonna live this crazy life, and then, and then at the last second, just get baptized. Well, um, that's kind of that's kind of abusing God's graces, you know, um, to have that kind of an attitude. And I guess, I guess after baptism, you, you know, one can have that with the sacrament of reconciliation too, to presume upon God's mercy. So, I mean, the attitude of heart, disposition of one being baptized should be, you know, I'm truly repentant for my sins. Um, in fact. And you might recall reading in the text that if one, you know, and if you're preparing someone for our, through RCA for baptism at some point, which many of you might be doing, or you might have already done it, it would be good to remind um, those catechumens that, uh, that it's necessary to repent in their heart of all their sins, okay? And to try to do an examination of conscience even, like we do when we prepare for confession. Now, they're not going to have all the sins that we can have, being knowledgeable about the truth, because they didn't know certain things before many, many times. You'll find that um, adults preparing for baptism, you know, they just don't know the truth in many areas of, of our lives. And so, um, obviously, to, in order to have a sin, you have to, you have to know it's wrong and you have to freely choose it. So if, if some of that is missing, then, you know, objectively it might be wrong and it might be a sin, but but I think it's still good for the catechumen to go through that, though, um, even if they got one of those examination of conscience that we usually give out for the sacrament of reconciliation, that they would, or take the catechism and go through the Ten Commandments section. You know, there's those. That's pretty long, but but you know, some kind of a examination so that you know they have something to, something to use to look back into their heart with the Holy Spirit to ask forgiveness. And then, I, I always recommend to somebody preparing for baptism who's an adult, that you know you may remember certain things after your baptism because there's this enlightening that happens, right? Grace floods their whole being. And so they see things that they couldn't see before, blind spots that they had, and they recognize that yes, they chose those things and, and, and now they see them for what they are. And at that point, even though they didn't remember to repent before their baptism, to repent immediately after their baptism, uh, those sins are washed away and the damage is washed, is washed away too through that one baptism they've received. Uh, it's kind of like when one goes to confession, right? Where if we forget certain sins, we're certainly... Uh, forgiven of the guilt, and we'll talk more about this when we talk about reconciliation, but uh, 
if they were of more serious nature, we still need to bring them back to our next confession and say, we don't need to worry that we're not forgiven, but the confession, the oral part of this, the, the verbal part of this has to happen. Um, later, <coughs> Father, I remember these things since my last confession, and I, I'm just confessing them now, you know. So that, the same two things, the same thing happens with baptism and with confirmation. It's just that baptism is received only once, and one doesn't have to go to confession for sins that were confessed, I mean that were, were committed before one's baptism. But one does need a repentant attitude in their heart toward any of those sins, no matter when they're remembered. Okay? Okay. Certain temporal consequences of sin remain, and that's, that's kind of obvious. We talked about that a few classes ago, about what that is like. Um, that the effects in our, in our hearts and in our lives, in each other and in the world, some of those still remain even though we're not responsible to pay back in any way for that after baptism. Okay, number uh, page 10. <coughs> Baptism makes the neophyte, the neophyte, um, neo meaning new, right? A new creation, an adopted son or daughter of God, partaker of the divine nat nature, member of Christ, co heir of the kingdom, temple of the Holy Spirit. So on your quiz, uh, all those, you know, any of those could have been put down for the, the graces received in baptism. Those are. Those, any gift that we receive in baptism is also grace, and I didn't specify what those were, so I'm assuming probably all of us, you know, had, had good answers on that, but we'll see. Um, so all these things. Partaker of the divine nature, divinization. We spent a lot, a lot of time on that before. Okay. A member of Christ. So in other words... We use the image of St. Paul, right? The church is the body of Christ. And we all have our role to play as any member of the body plays in our human life. Okay, the hand, the foot, so on and so forth. St. Paul goes through all that. <laughs> you know, the foot can't do something if the, if, the, if the head isn't there and da 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 and he goes through this big long list. Uh, so, each of us have now a certain role to play within the body of Christ that has to be discerned, and once we receive the grace of baptism, we can begin to discern our more particular calling as a member of the body of Christ. That we have a particular vocation within the body of Christ. There are obviously major vocations, priesthood, diaconate, holy orders, obviously. There's marriage. There's consecrated life. But there are also many other ways to be um, fully alive and fully participating members in the body of Christ, and baptism gives us the grace to do that. When a baby is baptized, uh, you could say that God plants the Christian vocation to become holy. That's the first vocation for all of us, and that's given to us in baptism, the first calling. But also... Uh, our particular and personal vocation is given to us because we have, you know, a special call within the body of Christ that is particular to us to, as individuals. So that is really the seed of that is given in baptism and then, of course, one through, through um, prayer and discernment and uh, growth in God's grace and the gifts of the Holy Spirit can come to know and understand that vocation that has been planted in the heart of baptism. A co-heir of the kingdom. One could say that when, when we're baptized, uh, this, is, this is in the ritual, right? It says, it says as Christ was anointed priest, prophet, and, and king, so you are anointed to the, to the newly baptized person or, or infant. And so we have a share in Christ's, uh, we call that the three munera, the three offices of Christ, the three... Uh, uh, missions that Christ has, you could say, also. He's been given these, these gifts of, of, of operating in the history of salvation in time and in space and in eternity. <laughs> and he gives us a share in those, in those particular offices according to our state in the church. Okay? 
Obviously, when one is ordained in holy orders, one one takes a different uh, gains a different share in those three offices of Christ. But every baptized person does. So I become a priest along with <coughs> Jesus in this sense, not in the sense that I am a, a, a minister of the priesthood of Christ or, or Christ's minister standing in his person, but that uh, I am able to offer my life being spiritually united with Jesus who offered his life in his suffering, death, and resurrection to the Father as an act of worship, a, a, a sacrifice offered back to God, acceptable because now I am united with Christ. And that, that goes back to what we drew on the board last week. Remember the alien justification drawing, right? So, so I'm, through this suffering, death, and resurrection, I'm on the Christ with cross. I'm, on, I'm on, the, on the cross with Christ, and I'm in the tomb with him, and I rise with him in baptism. I'm not behind there, and he's just kind of covering. He does. He doesn't see me, or as as Luther said, <laughs> as Luther said, we kind of remain this dung hill. Okay, we all know what dung is. I won't use other words. You all know what that means. And besides, I'm being recorded. So, <laughs> so you know, he said that basically the grace of Christ covers us like snow covers a dung hill. So that God the Father sees this pure white snow and he doesn't really recognize the dung that's underneath. Well, no, that isn't. The grace of baptism truly transforms us from the inside. So now we're purified, we're healed, we're forgiven, we're changed from the inside out. And so we do really become priests along with Christ to offer ourselves to the Father as a gift back to him. Because Christ makes us worthy and he makes us uh, he makes us able worthy and able to do it okay and then of course uh, we become prophets along with Jesus Christ um, to speak the truth about God in everything we say and everything we do we have the grace to live in in, in spirit and in truth and of course, by the way we live and by everything we say, uh, we are to give witness to Christ and his Holy Spirit dwelling in us through the sacrament of baptism um, and strengthen in confirmation later uh, gives us the, the capability and the ability um, to do that. And then finally, uh, we are made, uh, you could say, princes and princesses in the kingdom of God, right? Christ is the king and we have a share in his kingship. So if we've ever, um, I think it's, it's the, the Narnia series. Have you ever seen the movies or read the books? Okay. Well, the whole thing is, is about that, right? I mean, it's about, it's about the children, you know, uh, becoming princesses and princes in the kingdom of, of the, uh, the lion, right? The lion, what's the lion's name in that? Aslan. 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 Yes. Right. So, so it might be good to, to go back and watch those films or read the books in light of the sacrament of baptism, in light of the fact that we are are, are co heirs of the kingdom with Christ. Okay. Partakers in the divine nature. All these things are are kind of uh, depicted through that allegory that that is um, the Narnia tales. So. You know, if, if you've got young people that you're working with, those are great things to read to them or to have them watch and then to talk about baptism or talk about who they are in the kingdom of God and in the church uh, because that's really what that story is all about. So, And of course, you know, if you're, and maybe even if you're catechizing adults and they, and they know those stories, you know, you can make those connections. Okay. Page 11. Sanctifying grace enables us to believe, to hope, and to love. So when sanctify, we haven't talked a lot about this, but when sanctifying grace comes into us, along with that sanctifying grace comes the gifts of faith, hope, and charity. Okay. And 
we could spend a lot of time talking about the gifts of faith, hope, and charity. I mean, but we have to remember these gifts are, you know, there is faith on a human level, right? I can believe that the sun's going to rise tomorrow because I have reason to believe it's going to. It might not, though. <laughs> this might be the end of the world, the end of the universe, and they won't come up. But I, so I have to have faith that it's going to come up tomorrow. Yes, it's faith given my experience in the past, but yet it's faith on a human level. But this is, this is the divine gift of faith, okay? God infusing into our hearts the power to believe him and everything that he reveals to us. All the content of the Catholic faith that's been given to us to the apostles, it's an ability to accept that and to believe it, to make it my own, okay? And, and to trust that it's true to trust God and everything he reveals through his son Jesus Christ through the church. Okay? It's a divine gift. It's a power within us. To hope in God. Okay? To hope in God, but also to trust in his promises that what he says we will receive, the gift of eternal life and every other good gift, that we can trust that his promises are true. And that if we are faithful by the help of his grace that he will be faithful to us. Okay. It's not like just, you know, human hope that, or, or hoping, well, I'm hoping that this happens or that happens. Well, no, I'm hoping I get to heaven. Well, <laughs> no, it's a deep trust that God will fulfill his promises to me. You know, it's not just something up high in the sky, oh, I hope I win, you know, the, uh, the Powerball this week. You know. <laughs> uh, no, we have reason to hope because, because he lives in us to love God, charity. So it isn't just, you know, love on a natural level where I want, I, I want the good of another person or I want my, you know, good for myself. I, you know, I truly do. But it's that... I love God for the sake of who he is. And I love all the others around me because they're his. His sons and daughters. Or at least his, his lost sons and daughters, you know. Um, to love, above, above, love God above all things and to love my neighbor as myself. But I can't do that in my fallen humanity. I need the very love of God. This is divine charity. It's God's love planted in me. It's not my human love that I can have for my wife. Or And, and in the sacrament of marriage, God infuses the marriage with his divine love too. Okay, But on a natural level, I can have human love with my family members, my friends, this kind of thing. But in this, this love goes beyond that. I'm able to love all others because God gives me the ability to do that. Okay, and I'm, loved, I'm able to love him above all things because of who he is. To live and act under the properties of the Holy Spirit, to grow in goodness and moral virtue. All those, all those gifts that we need to live out the Christian life are, are given to us, planted in us in our baptism. Page 12. Okay. Baptism incorporates us into the church. So you could say this. If, if baptism is a covenant between us and God, which can't be broken, well, it is, but it's also a covenant among all the members of the church so that I can't simply, I can, I can break communion, but, but I'm always part of the body of Christ, even if I'm a, my, my life in, in the body of Christ, I'm, I'm kind of a dead member, but I'm still connected and what, what still connects me? The, the, what spiritual reality still connects me? What, is this what, what part of baptism is this happening through? Yes. Right, the character. Right, so I'm marked for, for Christ by that character, but I'm marked as a member of the body of Christ, the church, and, and I can't get rid of that either. So I have a relationship with all these other people. In fact, the church in heaven those who have been Christians since the beginning, those, I mean, and, and actually Adam and Eve for that matter. I, I, am, I am a family member with them, and they can't be broken. I might wander away from the family, but I'm still a member of the family. And that gives us hope, because when we call people back to come back to the Catholic Church, there's already that disposition in them 
So we can't think that, you know, once you're Catholic, you're always Catholic. You know, you, you can try to run away, you can run very far away, but you, you know, it's there. Baptism gives us share in the common priesthood. We talked about that. Uh, baptism calls each to belong to Christ and to be subject to others to serve, obey, and submit. Ooh. So we need to submit to others for the sake of their good and the sake of their salvation. And that obviously needs to be discerned <laughs> constantly. What does that mean? To surrender to others for, for the good of their salvation. It means a lot of things. Baptism constitutes the sacramental bond of unity existing among all who are reborn. Okay. All right. Okay. The indelible spiritual marks and no sin can erase it. Consecrates a person for religious worship. Okay. Commits one as a witness of holy life and practical charity. Sealed for the promise of eternal life. We've kind of worked through that already. Okay, baptism, the gate of the sacraments, necessary, code of Canon Law 49. Baptism, the gate to the sacraments, necessary for salvation in fact, or at least in intention, by which men and women are freed from their sins and reborn as children of God and configured to Christ by an indelible character, are incorporated in the church, is validly conferred only by washing with true water together with the required form of words. Okay. Well, there's your matter and form at the end there. You've also got um, that there's a couple of kinds of baptism, that which happens in fact and that which happens in intention. And what, what are those ways of being baptized by intention? I'm sure it was in both the catechism and in <coughs> your chapter. Baptism by blood. By blood, okay. By desire. Right? Okay. You sincerely want to be baptized even though you're at the end of your life and you don't have the form of matter available to you. So that sure. would be like an agreement, a covenant with God. In your Intention. Right. Intention. Right. Baptism by desire, we call that. And one could say, although we don't know, and we'll talk about this in a few minutes, but baptism... Uh, even for children who haven't been baptized yet, but their parents intend them to be baptized, if, they, if they're able to profess faith um, at the time of baptism, then, then my guess is they're probably, spiritually speaking, able to intend baptism for that baby, and there's probably, if should they should die before baptism, just like a catechumen would die before baptism, and going through the process of... of, uh, of uh, you know, uh, formation in the catechumenate before baptism, if, if that person dies, they're owed a funeral in the Catholic Church. So the presumption is they have the baptism of desire already, and we might be able to extend that to parents who have baptized or desire for their, their babies, even maybe their unborn babies. You know, we can't necessarily go that far in saying that, but I, I mean, that they're, they're absolutely saved, but we have every reason to hope, and there's a number of reasons to hope that those children are saved. Yes. The the part you talked about, it was in the book you know, about the status of limbo, and there's right. always a big, depending on who you talk to, about the definition of limbo, even if there is. I'm not sure why that is, because really, it's just it's it's one possible explanation as to how God works out. Uh, their eternal happiness and rest. Because if I remember right, the, yeah. book, the book says it, on the Catholic view, it, and it's like the very last page on the chapter of baptism, and the page before talks about the Catholics. The Church's view is that it that's the hope of the of the Church that a uh, baby that's not baptized, you know, still born around the case may be, is granted the graces of God to be allowed into His heavenly kingdom. Now, mm -hmm. if we were talking to parents. How, what is a good way to explain that in nice, simple terms? I mean, is that the correct... If you're point? talking to someone who's lost a child yeah. or a baby, yeah. I, I, would say, I would say, first of all, I, I would talk with them about the baptism of desire. And through that, that they wanted baptism for their baby, they have every reason to hope that their baby is saved and with the Lord. I think you always have to use that phraseology, you know, you have every reason to hope for their salvation. 
first of all, it's because, because um, Jesus Christ wills that all people be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. That's a biblical principle, right? God, he, God wills that all people be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. And so therefore, th that's the basic principle, that if someone can be saved, it's possible for them to be saved, and God would work it. Outside of the sacraments, we know that the sacraments work salvation. We don't know how God does that in other ways outside of, the, of the, what we call the economy of salvation. Okay, I mean, out of the economy of the sacraments. We don't know how he works salvation outside of that. So, but we have every reason to hope because he wills that all people be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. <clears throat> he died that all be saved. Okay. And, and we do believe in the baptism of desire. So you put those all together and you have lots of reasons to hope. <laughs> and lots of reasons to give hope to parents who lose children. But we can't come out, come out right and say that they're in heaven with God and they're certainly saved. Of course, we can't say that for anyone who dies, can we? Unless they're canonized saints, I guess. Then we can. Because there's been some kind of supernatural proof that that's the case. So, uh, so I, I, don't, I, I think it wouldn't, our answer wouldn't be that much different for those children than it would be for other baptized people that we know about. Because we don't know what state of soul they had either, to be honest with you. Right? So, so we have every reason to, believe, to hope that anyone who dies that is a Christian or is the child of Christians would be saved. And maybe even if they're not Christian, but we don't know how that works. But if God could work it, he'll work it. Okay. Well, we better take our break. Father Gerda? Yeah. I sent that to you, so I don't know if you have a way to check your email here or not. Yeah. I got to clear out a bunch of my messages and I keep having to turn my phone off and on. I probably need to download the new system, but I don't like the new systems. I like the old systems. So oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm fighting that now. I just. It, it wanted to upgrade, and I let it upgrade, and I was like, what a mess. So, but I've got, you know, I've got overload on my information on here. That's yeah. the problem, so. Yeah, I, well, I sent it first, and it, it rejected it. So that next morning, I, I forwarded it to Jane and said, I don't know what I did wrong. Um, you know, I took it right off of his email, and she emailed me back. She said, you forgot the F. <laughs> in the front. So she said, but I, I will forward it on. So I... I well, you know, it, I didn't see it. It might be there. But when I did my search on your name, your name should have been somewhere in that email. It should have popped up somewhere for me, but it didn't. Um, well, it, 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 my email doesn't have my name in it. It's P-S-I-R-K. But you, the, the con the stuff yeah. inside the email had that in it, which it was right. the search looks for that, too. Yeah, you should have had, I mean, because yeah. you sent, sent stuff to me, so it should have popped up. Right. <laughs> I'm going to go. 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 I'
There it is. There it is. Okay. Uh, you got it. As you said, the word strength of our but I forgot about that. From Moose and all these things, those kinds of things. Um, I have a neurological disorder, and sometimes my handwriting goes out. And so if you can't read anything on my quiz, basically, um, you can't read something you know, I can hear you. Sometimes it gets really bad. You're covered by, I don't even say that. All right. <laughs> Yes, I did. <laughs> so, a good friend of mine. <laughs> he needs some guidance. His name was Tim. Tim needs Yeah. 
Lord let him go to work today. I am. You still want to Yes, sir. I've been there. 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 His mother, no, no, his father, is my great grandmother. And my great grandmother. And my I went to see him. And uh, he told me that's what I thought my great grandmother was. I never heard of her. Raw material plans. And then a week later, I'm going to try to get him. Buy all the fun up. Well, the truth is, what is really wonderful is, he had not had any. Yeah, sorry, I kind of spread out. I apologize. It's like a industry. My wife's in I'm enjoying my vendor of suffering the main reason why they want to sit down. This was a couple of years ago. Yeah, it felt good. I asked him if he was in Indiana and went to confession, and so I was in the Saxon and went to confession. He said, Yeah, I went to confession. I mean, my job is to I when they work, they're making a darn good money. So, okay. Usually, I tell them to do it. Morning, I'll tell them to do it. Well, it must be hard to tell them to experience it. Well, that's what I mean. 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 Jesus was the man of suffering. He had gold to trade. My cup still under there from last week. <laughs> they really don't touch anything under here. I could probably leave things here for a couple of years. <laughs> okay, folks. Better get our plates plates together there. Looks good. I had a big lunch though. Colorful plate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Take your plate home for tonight, Father. Wow. From what your emails say, you don't go to bed very early. No, I know. <laughs> I wish I could, but it's just you know, wear two or three hats. That's what I get. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're, uh, that's my hobby. What's this is my hobby. This is. This is what they do for my hobby. My job is being pastor, but location director and these kinds of things are my hobby. 
that doesn't sound like a hobby to me. It's going to a pretty broad career. How <laughs> about a full career? There you go. How about a full You're release? You're guy you have. Yeah. But this is my life, this afternoon. This is who I am. <laughs> this is who I am. It couldn't get any better than this, to be honest with you. It's on your slate. We can tell that in your presentation. That's very easy. Well, I mean, the, the sacraments are our life. I mean, really. Because Jesus himself, mm -hmm. giving us himself. Mm -hmm. Can't go wrong with that. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. So, oh, no more. Yeah. No more. It's okay. You don't have beer in there, do you? Oh, that's mm -hmm. That is the Greek word for Savior, soter. Hmm. And, you know, we were talking about how God works salvation, okay? Remember the, the whole alien justice thing? How does this salvation thing work itself out? How does one... How does one receive the grace of justification? How is one, how is the suffering, death, and resurrection applied to us in the here and now? And how are we individually saved through the Paschal mystery? Okay, that's the study of that. The study of how we're saved is called soteriology. Soteriology. I think it's in your book. That's a good word, theological word to know. But it's the study of how we're saved, study of salvation. Um, so that's the Greek word, so it comes from the Greek word soter, which means savior. How are we saved? How are we saved? The study of how we're saved. And that's obviously one of the big things with, between Protestants and Catholics, right? I mean, that's one of right. The, right, but, but the sacrament of baptism is really at the heart of that discussion. It is the sacrament that, that expresses, actually brings into reality, um, the beginning of our salvation mm -hmm. is we, the, the grace of salvation that Christ won for us in his suffering, death, and resurrection is, this is another technically technical theological term, is appropriated to us through baptism. Big word, appropriation, right? Appropriated to us through baptism. So how, how, how are we saved by the, the grace of Christ? Through his, gained through his suffering, death, and resurrection, the grace of salvation that he gained for us through his suffering, death, and resurrection is applied to us in the here and now, first of all and primarily through the grace of baptism, through his gift of, of the graces of baptism. So we're saved in the here and now, in time and space, you in particular, right now at this moment, through the graces of your baptism. And that, that grace is supported, nourished, strengthened, and grown through the grace of all the other sacraments. And so St. Paul, and I, I can't remember the exact place now, <coughs> talks about, about that we are being saved by, by his grace. We're being saved. He uses the word, the Greek word, for being saved. Not that we're saved. He doesn't save. Yes, actually, he says, we, we were saved by it, and we're being saved by it at this very moment. That is the grace of Christ, right? So our salvation is not complete until, until we're glorified, right? So it's, we're justified, the grace of justification, right? Through the suffering, death, and resurrection of Jesus, appropriated to us through the sacrament of baptism, first of all, and then nourished and grown through all the other sacraments. But that really then is once we once we receive the great grace of justification, then then it becomes a process of sanctification, right? So we're we're justified by bapt by the grace of baptism. And then we're sanctified by cooperating with the graces of our baptism. Okay, remember, the, we talked about the whole cooperation thing last time. We're not going to go into all that cooperation here, all of that. And then, and then all the other, the, the remaining six sacraments, really, are about, about our sanctification. 
obviously, you know, reconciliation is about restoring this grace fully or if, we, if we lost it, okay? But nevertheless, that's another sanctification. So sanctifying grace re-enters our heart and soul again. We already received it once. Sanctified, and then in heaven, and then, of course, when, when we're being sanctified, we're, once we're justified and then being saved, being sanctified, okay, we are then called to build, build the kingdom of God, right, in every way we can, with everything we say and do, with the help of God's grace and cooperation with that grace. And then, once we've cooperated with the grace of justification, sanctification, our final grace that we receive is glorification, right? Then we're glorified. So, so the fullness of Christ's gift of salvation, I could, I could, guess you could say the gift of the grace of salvation that has begun through justification and baptism and continues to grow and we are becoming holier and holier and holier through the rest of our life through cooperation with sanctifying grace and, and supported by the grace of the other sacraments. Finally, <clears throat> finally, Christ wins the crown of of salvation for us through his suffering, death, and resurrection in our own suffering, death, and resurrection and entry into heavenly glory. Okay. But of course, this part doesn't really stop. This doesn't necessarily stop at death, though, does it? Because we could need purification. Well, we're always needing purification <laughs> all the way through this life. But then that purification continues many times into eternal life, right? And that's what we call purgatory. The final, the final purification, the final sanctification before glorification, before becoming saints in the full sense of the word. Okay? So, yes, are we saved by the grace of Christ through baptism? Yes. But are we also being saved by it right now and at every moment of our lives until we're glorified? Yes. So once saved, always saved? No. <laughs> once saved and being saved is our answer to that question that our Protestant brothers and sisters many times. Once saved, I'm always saved. I've, I, I've, I've pled the blood of Jesus and he has washed me in it and now I'm on my way. Well, yes, you're on your way, but you're being saved by cooperating with grace and continue to receive grace, you know, and continuing to be sanctified. Yeah, I once had an Eastern Catholic priest who, when I first got ordained, I used to like to go to the, the uh, Ukrainian Catholic church in, in this one town where I was, and, and he asked me to, I showed up for their divine liturgy one day, and I asked if I could can celebrate their divine liturgy, and he asked me, well, we usually hear confessions before, you know, the liturgy, and, and would you like to do that for me today? And I said, yes. And while I sat in there, I don't think anybody came. And, and I came back out, and, 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 and he said, yeah, I, yeah I, I don't think they understand that they need to be sanctified, is what he said to me. <laughs> We're always in need of sanctification and growing in holiness, right? So, and the sacraments are, are God's way of doing that in us and for us. With Father, our cool, yeah. What do you think about the Protestants who feel that way? Once saved, always saved. Do they have a shot at heaven? <laughs> of course they do. If they are living in the grace of their baptism, then yes, of course. But what about the accumulation of sins and even mortal sins throughout their life? Well, obviously, uh, they need to have those forgiven in some way, shape, or form, or they can't enter eternal life. Now, can God do that outside of the sacrament of reconciliation? Of course he could, if they have perfect contrition, which we'll talk about, you know, we talk about confession. But, but we don't know. We don't know that they have perfect contrition, and ultimately they don't know either. They'll only find out on the other side. But we know, because God's graces are restored to us through imperfect contrition and reconciliation, sanctifying grace is restored to us, that, uh, that we can have, um, we have the assurance that even if our contrition is imperfect, 
um, sanctifying grace is restored in us. So, so we have a greater assurance of that than they do, I think. They have to hope and get, I mean, hope on a human level hope. I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope he's going to accept me when I get to the pearly gates. And I, they don't have an assurance, visible, hearable, external assurance, because we live in a material world, that in fact they, you know, they're, they're most likely in the state of sanctifying grace. That would be awful. I don't know what that would be like. So, Well, I do know what that would be like, because I've probably been inside of a state of grace before, and it's not a very good place to be. <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. Yes? Can you ever fully defeat grace in yourself? Through mortal sin, yes. Okay, like fully That's why they call it mortal of, sin. Right, because right, right, God's light dies in us through mortal sin, yes. So the seal, the character, in that sense, it has nothing to do with the grace. I mean, right. Let's put it this way. Faith, hope, and charity are dead in me if I commit mortal sin. Right. The mark is there. The disposition toward that grace to be capable of receiving it is there. But it's, it's a dead faith, hope, and charity that, that well, it's, a, it's a dead. There's no life in it. Okay. Okay. The word baptism. We read. We read that. You know, I'm going to leave a lot of this to your book. You know, and, and to your to the catechism. But baptizo means I baptize. So if you were doing a baptism in Greek, I baptize you. You'd say baptizo. <laughs> okay. To immerse or to plunge. Right. Okay. Yeah, this, this, this section of Titus 3, 5, though, and, and, and John 3, where this <coughs> conversation with Nicodemus is important when we have a conversation with Protestant Christians about baptism. And some of them who don't accept, we read in our text about the, the people that, you know, different viewpoints about what baptism means. Do I, is it really necessary for salvation? Or is it a nice ceremony to go through, but it's God's gift of faith in the heart that saves me, and I'm not saved through baptism and by baptism. For us, it's both and. We're saved by faith through baptism. That's what the scriptures say, too, though. Saved by faith through baptism. I mean, St. Paul talks about the washing of regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit. Well, washing, it's, a, it, it's connected with water. What else could he be referring to except... Um, an actual baptism, because that's what baptism is. It's, a, it's an external washing, but an internal washing and renewal by the Holy Spirit. And then there's an enlightenment by grace. We've talked a lot about that. Okay, Typology. Um, I'm not going to go through all this typology with you now. I think it's important for you to read that section of the, of the text that talks about typology. It's all over the baptismal liturgy. When, when the blessing of the water, I don't know if you've, if you've, if you've ever seen, how many of us have actually had a chance to look at the ritual on the right before. If you've gone to the Easter vigil, you heard the blessing of water. It talks about all the places where, where, um, where Christ was present in type in the Old Testament, saving through water, saving the chosen people through water. Okay? And other places where God used water to save well, chosen people. We often discuss that during the Easter Vigil service, right? Oh yes, yeah, all over the place. The water, so. All over the place. There's typology in the Easter Vigil, from from the the seven readings that are read before the Gloria and the and the Epistle and the Gospel, um, to the blessing of the fire. To I mean, there's there's Old Testament typology, okay, types and antitypes. Where, where, can we see, where can we see Christ present and active as the Son of God, the second person of the Blessed Trinity, kind of revealing himself through the course of Old Testament, the lives of Old Testament figures? That's what's happening. So when we, when, we, when we read about Moses now, we can look back and see, oh, what is the life of Moses saying about who Christ is and what he would do? And everything in the Old Testament, you know, Christ is active in that. So there are lots of types of Christ in the Old Testament, and types of salvation in the Old Testament. A type meaning something that would point to the reality that would come when Christ suffered, died, and rose from the dead in the New Testament. Right? 
Okay, so I would I would simply learn those all because when you catechize other people about this, this is great stuff to use. And it's great biblical stuff if you've got Protestant Christians you're trying to dialogue with about this, whether they be in RCI already or whether they not be in RCI already. So that so that there's a, you know, this is all pointing toward our salvation in Christ's suffering, death, and resurrection, and the sa the life of grace through the through the sacraments. God was acting in external ways in the Old Testament to save his chosen people, but, but that was all to point to the time when he was going to be saving us by the power of the Holy Spirit through outward signs, but internal. Okay. Prefigurations of baptism, again, um, important to read through those so that you get, um, get that... The, the typology, the, the, the figures, um, it's all over the place, okay? Obviously, you know, God saving the shows his uh, Noah through the, the waters of the flood so that, that, you know, all humanity died, but humanity was, was saved and resurrected, you could say, when the flood waters receded. All pointing to what he would do through baptism. Um, on 19, okay, this is... Uh, other Old Testament types of baptism. Circumcision, okay. You read St. Paul to the Colossians, he's going to talk about that, right? Um, Moses striking the rock, Naaman healed from le 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 leprosy. You remember that story of, of, of Naaman? Okay, he was not, he was not, of, he was not an Israelite, he was a, a Gentile. And they asked him to go wash in the, in the Jordan River seven times. And he didn't want to do, what is this? This is crazy. You expect me to go down there and do all this stuff? If you're who you say you are, then why don't you just heal me here and now? No, he had to put his trust in the word of God. The one true God as, as revealed through the chosen people, Israel. Okay. All right. Okay. John, the baptism of John. Okay, this is good to spend a little time with, okay? The difference, what's the difference between the baptism of John and the baptism of, of, of that Jesus commands, you know, in the gospel? When he says, go forth and baptize all nations in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. What's the difference between those two? And, and John was baptizing in the Jordan, but Jesus was baptizing, had his apostles baptizing too, and then commanded them to after he went to the Father. <coughs> Or as he was going to the Father, right? So, John baptized with water, and Jesus baptized with the Holy Spirit, gives of the Holy Spirit. That's what that's what uh, that's what uh, John says, right? Mm -hmm. I, I baptize with water; you will baptize you with the Holy Spirit, right? So this it's a new kind of baptism. So basically, what happened with Saint John the Baptist was people were going into the river and confessing their sins. <laughs> Notice they were confessing their sins. But it was all an external sign of repentance. They weren't receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit that would cleanse and transform them, you know, like we're talking about baptism doing for us now. The difficulty with some Protestant, some Protestant viewpoints, because there's many, of what baptism does is that if, if, if this is what, I mean, if this isn't what baptism is about, okay, then, then most of them are actually still accepting a form of the baptism of St. John the Baptist, because <laughs> it's all external and it isn't internal, and there's not a necessary connection to what's happening on the outside, what I'm saying, and what God's doing inside of me. Weren't there, that there were baptisms done between the baptism of John and the Paschal, the post Paschal baptism? Right, by the disciples of by Jesus. The disciples. Right. So and we, were, we would have to assume that that was baptism in, of the New Testament happening. Or, on the other hand, it was it was the pre-Paschal institution of baptism. Yeah, that was in the book. Yeah, the pre-Paschal. Remember the pre-Paschal and post-Paschal. That's good to know those things too. I did I didn't get to put those things on this chart, but one day I actually will. You could extend that and put all those kinds of things on. You could put the typology and you could put. You know, I didn't put all those columns on there, but if you're going to teach baptism, you might do that. Just go and put your pre-Paschal um, pre and post-Paschal institution, and also um, typology and other things on this chart. Um, yeah, so you, could, you, you would probably say it was 
it, it, it was possibly the instant it was the institution of, of baptism as Jesus was instituting it but it didn't have its power until he breathed on them on Easter Sunday night right until he rose from the dead it couldn't the grace couldn't be complete and, and and they went let's put it this way the people at that time actually did spiritually go down into the water and were dying with Christ but they couldn't be fully resurrected spiritually speaking until he had risen from the dead so I think we could look at it that way. John's baptism was a little, you could say a little bit before that. That was, it was, it was even a, a, a I guess, a, a further, a prefiguring that was further away from what that baptism the apostles were doing. You know, we don't know exactly because it, it doesn't give us details of that baptism and probably on purpose because it was all pointing to, you know, the baptism of John was dying away and the baptism of the new covenant was beginning. So. But, but the Jews had a cleansing ritual, reminiscent of the baptism. Yeah, right. Coming back which, to the Jewish rite. Which is pretty much, you know, John the Baptist is developing on that. And it's moving closer and closer and closer to, to new covenant baptism, right? Yeah. Father, what does this mean here? Baptized you by the Holy Spirit and with fire. What is fire? What's well, fire is, is significant of... It, it, I mean, it's it's an external sign of the presence of the Holy Spirit, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I don't. I wouldn't see them as separate things necessarily. I, I, you could almost say it's a it's a it's a further specification of the kind of grace that the Holy Spirit brings. Well, fire cleanses too, right? So fire cleanses. Fire, um, well, fire, but it, I think, ignites. So it, it, it brings it brings a life that wasn't there before. It had, fire has a life of its own, right? <laughs> Thank you. And fire changes, doesn't it? It changes from one substance into another substance, philosophically speaking. But you begin with, with, you know, I don't know, uh, palms, branches, and you end up with ashes. They're, too, they're not the same reality anymore. So when the, Holy, the fire of the Holy Spirit comes into me, I'm not the same reality anymore. My whole being has been changed by sanctifying grace. Okay. Uh, okay, opinions regarding the Institute of Baptism. If we had more time, and this was a full course on baptism and confirmation, we may talk about that in more depth. But this is... Um, you know, this is where the doctors and the saints of the church have have seen, you know, Christ instituting baptism where that happens. So that's great if you're going to teach the sacrament, okay? Um, we just talked about 22. Right, the pre-Paschal, post-Paschal. Yeah, we, we're not going to read through these in detail because they're in your book. And you should, you should know them and know them well to teach, but... Uh, Post-Paschal institution. No, let's let's look at twenty. Yeah, let's just look at twenty-three for a minute. Okay. <clears throat> the water flowing from the pierced part of Christ is a sign of the grace of baptism in the church. It is essential that we relate the institution of each of the sacraments directly with the Paschal mystery of Christ. Okay. Yes. So whenever we talk about them, we should talk about their connection to the suffering, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And when you're teaching people, teach them the meaning of the word Paschal because no one really knows what that means. And if you just use that word, nobody's going to know what it means. Pasch means lamb. And so Jesus is the sacrificial lamb whose sacrifice actually brings us back to forgiveness of sins and union with God where all the animal sacrifices of the Old Testament didn't do that. So the Paschal mystery, though, is actually the process of the Lamb offering himself to the Father, this, his suffering and his <coughs> resurrection, the whole thing. Okay. And ascension. We don't want to, because it's crowned by the ascension, okay? And that's where he finally takes his throne as king of the universe. So, so we should always include the ascension in that Paschal mystery. Sometimes we don't do that. 
the sending of the Holy Spirit isn't necessarily part of the Paschal Mystery. That's how the Paschal Mystery is applied to us. So Pentecost is how, how the Paschal Mystery, the salvation that is won through the Paschal Mystery, is applied to the Church and to each of us individually, right? So at the Ascension, really, Christ takes his throne, and from there he distributes the divine gifts of grace. Okay, when he claims his rightful throne as king of heaven and earth on the human and the divine levels. Okay. On the day of the Ascension, Christ commissioned the apostles to preach and baptize. When Peter and the other apostles baptized on Pentecost, full ecclesial significance of the sacrament is realized. Well, we just kind of said that. Okay, so yeah, full ecclesial significance. Well, three thousand were baptized that day. The church is born. The church is born through the apostles, the first bishops, and then they become in because they share fully in the priestly and and prophetic and kingly mission of Christ. They share fully in that because they stand in His person and exercise His authority. Um, they're then able to distribute those gifts of grace with full power and authority on Pentecost Day because they received the fullness of the gift of the Holy Spirit, which was first given to them on Easter Sunday night, but then completed when Christ descends to the right hand of the Father and sends the Spirit, uh, the fullness of the Spirit. Okay. All right. St. Paul on baptism. St. Paul develops and completes the doctrine of baptism that evolved from the teaching of our Lord. I mean, if you look from baptism in the Gospels to the baptism that, that St. Paul keeps talking about, I mean, it's just, it, it, it's, it's really rolling. I mean, it's, the understanding is deepening just within 20 or 30 years of the Paschal mystery actually occurring in time and history, okay? So there's no doubt that the practice of the early church reveals the will of Christ in terms of the gift of salvation that comes through, specifically through baptism. Okay, baptism um, conferred in the name of Christ, unites a man with death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord. We get that from St. Paul, right? The immersion represents the death and burial of Christ, and the coming out of the water symbolizes the resurrection and union with him. Um, <clears throat> baptism kills the body insofar as it is an instrument of sin and confers a share in the life of God and Christ. Okay. So, St. Paul is really... Um, he, he's, he's confirming, really, that Christ's main way of uniting us to his gift of salvation and his suffering, death, and resurrection is through baptism. Okay, the minister of baptism, the ordinary minister of baptism is the bishop, priest, or deacon. In case of emergency, anyone may baptize, including a non-believer, as long as he celebrates the sacrament as the church celebrates it and has the intention of doing what the church does when she baptizes. Okay. The recipient of baptism. Every person not yet baptized, and only such a person is able to be baptized. Okay, so what does that mean? If someone is baptized already, we have to take their baptism very seriously if they're coming into the Catholic Church. We have to do everything we can to get the proof of that baptism. If there is absolutely no proof that we can find, proof meaning some, some letter or record from the church, usually. However, if you can find a couple of people to testify to the pack, pack, fact that somebody was baptized and you have some photos of the baptism, that could possibly be enough proof. But normally, normally it would be, you know, some record from the church. Father, so do, is there like a master checklist if a Protestant wants to convert to Catholicism to prove it? I mean, do we be like Methodist? Oh, the baptism's good. You know, well, Lutheran's good. Or do we have to dig more deep? Yeah, and I, I think so, I think the. Class